it's probably fair to say that the Maserati name and brand is quite misunderstood by a lot of people, especially young people who probably don't know all of the accolades that it's achieved in its huge life. Take, for example, Gran Turismo. The GT moniker and the type of car, the niche of car, was invented by Maserati 75 years ago. And this year, there's whole car companies that celebrate their 75th birthday. Porsche, Land Rover, and a well-known other Italian car maker, perhaps. But yet, Maserati, is on the brink of celebrating 110 years. And in this video, I'm going to see where it is going in the future. Perhaps it's at its brightest point that it's been for decades, where it's back into single seat racing for the first time in six decades. Not only that, it's electric, and it's got electric road cars on sale. So that's the purpose of this episode. I'm gonna drive one of their newest electric cars. I'm gonna to speak to some people within the Maserati realm, and I'm going to the Formula E race where Maserati is celebrating their first season on the track. I'm Johnny Smith, you're watching The Late Break Show. Maserati made a name for itself in the racing world, their first car being in 1926 with the Tipo 26 driven by one of the Maserati brothers. And it actually uh, came first in class, it did extremely well, and that really was the catalyst for things to come. Then you've got cars like the 250F, which won Formula One and is wildly regarded as one of the best Formula One cars that ever has lived. And then you've got the Tipo 61 Birdcage. Again, another wild competition car. And in fact, those two cars, they seem to attract, let's just say old school rock stars. I'm pretty sure Nick Mason, the drummer of Pink Floyd, has a 250F. And I'm pretty sure the bloke that's constantly driving home for Christmas, Chris Rea, has got uh, a Tipo 61 Birdcage. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and claim that Maserati have, have built amazing products all of these years because there have been some dark times. There have been some bad Zeratis, I'm afraid. Probably the one that everyone likes to forget, the bi-turbo of the 80s. A very, very unreliable car. Uh, and also remember Maserati has come close to bankruptcy numerous times and it's been owned by various different companies over the time. However, not even an appearance on Miami Vice with a very young Bruce Willis was enough to save the bi-turbo. But there have been some amazing cars from Maserati. We mustn't forget that. Let's just talk about the original Ghibli from 1966. Wow, still one of the coolest looking cars of all time, I would say. And then you've got the Bora, then you've got the Merak. The 70s mid-engine V6 and V8 cars were spectacular. We mustn't forget, possibly my favorite concept car of all time, the Boomerang. The Maserati Boomerang, you only need to look at the steering wheel of that car to know how wild and imaginative it was. Now let's fast forward to 2004. 2004, under the ownership of Ferrari, the MC12 was launched, which was kind of a reclothed Enzo. A spectacular car, wild and road legal, limited to 50 units worldwide. And in the same year, they launched the Quattroporte, a car which rekindled that whole idea of performance, comfort and sportiness, but wrapped in a practical four-door shell. I'm really interested to see whether, right now, Maserati has finally found its feet after so many years of being slightly lost. It's moving into electrification. It's got one foot firmly in the piston world with 
amazing products like the MC20 supercar, which is all Maserati, not based on anything else, made in Modena. And then you've got cars like the Gran Turismo Folgore, which is available as a piston and an electric car, and I'm driving one in a bit. And I've got this, the Gricale. Which is, again, you can buy it as a piston or a full EV. You're getting the full suite. Is Maserati finally getting back on track, literally, by getting back on the racing track? after all these years. It's hard to believe that nearly a decade ago, 2014, Formula E was born. Nine seasons in, we're in the third generation of car. What are the differences between the original cars, the Gen 1 cars, and cars like this, the Maserati Tipo Folgare, which I actually think, I think the current gen of Formula E cars are prettier than the Formula One cars. I just think they look so good. I especially like these, this sort of cut, simple wing. So the Gen 3 car is almost five meters dead long, which is actually shorter than all of the others. 5.3 uh, meters long, the, um, the Gen 1 car was. This car is actually slightly higher than the Gen 1 car. It's narrower than the previous generations of car and wheelbase is ever so slightly shorter. 840 kilos in weight versus the first gen car, which is 920 kilo curb weight. 450 kilos of that was the battery pack. And remember that battery pack could not complete the entire race. They had to switch the cars. Just gives you an idea of how far the sort of high voltage EV technology has come in nine years. Skipping along quickly. Looking at the other stats as well. Maximum power of the first car, 200 kilowatts. This is 350 kilowatts with a maximum region of 600 kilowatts versus 100 kilowatts of regen in the generation one cars. These cars can now do 200 miles an hour. The first gen cars could only do 140. This has no rear brakes. It just uses hardcore regen. As I ponder this, I'm thinking there are gonna be purists who say, oh, you know, Maserati shouldn't be building a, an electric car and entering into a race series or even building electric cars. But for once, I think, in a long time, at least the manufacturers put their name on a car which has a drivetrain that's actually got some relevance and relationship to the cars it's actually selling. So many times I see people investing in motorsport and the cars that the humans, the customers buy, aren't relevant. These engines, these motors, front and rear, are developed with the manufacturer. And the two first electric cars that have a Maserati name ever are all-wheel drive, high performance EVs. In fact, the, uh, the Gran Turismo Folgore is probably as fast zero to 60 as this, but it can fit four adults in it. This is Maserati's first ever electric car. And it's interesting that they've chosen the Gran Turismo first, closely followed, albeit, by the Gricale. But of course, the DNA of this car, it all distills down to this Gran Turismo, these two words, Gran Turismo, which means it has to be comfortable, it has to be sporty, performance providing, but able to, to drive long distances and not make you feel unwell or uncomfortable. Now I've got it in one of the four, there they are, one of the four drive modes. So I've got it in, at the moment, GT. So you've got max range mode, which pairs everything back as you'd expect it to. GT mode, which gives you 80% of the overall power. Sport mode, which gives you 100%, a bit more slippage of the traction control and stuff like that. Um, with harder suspension. And then Corsa, which is race, and you could probably turn traction completely off. Let's just leave it in GT for now. Then, but in the middle, I've pressed that, look, you have S, sport damping. This is an air ride car. This has air suspension, so very adaptable and really good in, in other EVs of hiding the weight because the enemy of an electric car always is weight. This weighs 400 kilos, I think, more than the V6 counterpart. So just over 2.2 tonnes. The feel of the brake pedal is spot on. Steering is actually very good. I mean, it's quite hard with EVs to get those things right. It hides that 2.2 tonnes incredibly well. The air suspension seems to sort out 
these horrible British roads. Now, 1,350 newton meters of torque, even in kind of average mode, feels like this. I mean, I'm used to driving rapid electric cars these days, but the, certainly the mid-range punch in this car is really, it's really good. Um, and zero to 60 is in 2.7 seconds, so I know we can get carried away. There's sub two second cars now um, in the EV world. That is impressive. It's an 800 volt platform, which is really good because that means A, it's as future proof as you're gonna get. There's not many cars that do have 800 volts, Porsche being one of the few. Um, and it can charge up to 270 kilowatts rapid charge, which I think 15 minutes will see you 20 to 80 percent. So, yeah, these seats are um, a kind of a, yeah, upcycled, reclaimed waste from the sea. And then the weave here, it, it's kind of like carbon fibre that's been unvarnished. When you look closely, it looks like copper cord is running through it. And it's the same on the door card there. And then the leather here looks like it's kind of been attacked by a pizza wheel, like a uh, yeah, perforated pizza wheel or something like that. But it's good. It all feels like the kind of quality you'd expect from something like a premium German car, Audi, Porsche, that kind of thing, which I guess is what they're gunning for. Right, sport mode, zero to 62, three, two, one. Wow, okay. Yeah, that was quick. I mean, I knew it was going to be quick, but that was really quick. You might have heard a few keys and things. It's always the problem when we're filming. You hear clutter and clatter, because it's usually my notebook, the keys of the car, a drinks bottle. Real world, real world. I'm now on my way down to London for the Formula E e -pre, um, which I have never been to, actually. I've only ever been to one Formula E event. I keep missing the London one, it always clashes with something. And it's the only event, I think, on the Formula E calendar that comprises of a half indoor, half outdoor track. And because it's in the middle of a city, like so many um, of the Formula E races, in fact, 10 countries in this season alone, um, the series has been to, it explores places that you can race a car that you wouldn't normally be able to do if you were running a petrol you know, piston engine. And that's one of the things about EV, it is allowing you to be a little bit more flexible and creative. And to people that aren't fully in bed with Formula One and they're not, they've got less prejudices about new technology, i.e. probably younger people or progressive adults. I think it's a really interesting thing to follow, especially in nine seasons, how quickly Formula E seems to have evolved. I've come in nice and early. So I got down last night. Good thing about driving an electric car, of course, in London, you're exempt from ultra low emission zone stuff and congestion charge stuff. If I'd been in the piston Maserati, couldn't have done that. It's on charge at the hotel. And it's raining like hell. So if that continues during the racing, that's gonna be interesting what with half of it being indoor, half of it being outdoor, the track entirely changes. the first time I've seen generation three FE cars but the crucial thing for me and we'll see it over there is I always think motorsport should be very accepting very welcoming and not not, not elitist and I think Formula One's gone too far that way and what I found with the first event I ever went to was Formula E 
very, very welcoming, especially for young people. From a price point, point of view, tickets are a lot cheaper than the likes of Formula One, which bodes well to kind of build this into a brighter future. All the grandstands we've been past are already full, and it's 10 to 11, and yet the race doesn't start until five. Actually, three minutes past five. I don't know why. I don't know why it's 5.03. I'm going to have to find out because I'm curious. They're real. That's a real living wall. I love living walls. Got a bit of time to mooch around the outskirts of the pit garages. Have a little bit of a paddock walk. I should be able to have a chat with Maserati's head of Corsa, head of racing, this afternoon. Because he runs not just Formula E, he runs all Maserati racing, so piston and electric. Here we are. I'm excited because obviously this is Generation 3. And I didn't realise until today that the front motor is not driving the wheels, it's just for regeneration. Exactly. For, for right. now, yeah. So it's the first year of the Gen 3, exactly, as yep. you say. So we have a, a lot to improve again. So exactly, the, all the, the motors that, that is located at the back of the, of the car. So it's why we cannot take any picture because the difference between each team in this paddock is located at the back because we have the same chassis between each team. Yeah. We have the same battery and only the engine at the back which change between each team. So, so, so motors are um, independent. And, and some suspension. Exactly, we can change. So we're not allowed to show lots of close-ups of the exactly. front suspension. <laughs> yeah, please. And also, of course, the drivers and the strategy. Yeah. So in Formula E, as uh, the, the format of the race and the format of the journey, we like to say, is quite in intense. The race also format is quite short, we can yeah. say. It's around like 45 minutes. So now this year is the number of laps, it's not uh, timing. Last year it was on timing, now it's the number of laps, but it's yeah. still around 45 minutes. Expected there is safety car, of course. Yeah. So they choose to have this format. Even if the car can go, maybe like we can uh, maybe have the, the, the track for, for more like one hour, but we want some speed and to have some speed and action. It's why they decide to have this short format. Shorter race. Exactly. Let's and see. also the championship is family championship. So when you have your, the kids, so the first one is great because you don't have to have to wear headphones. Exactly. Yes. The noise of the car. There is some people who say like, oh, I would prefer like a thermic motors. But to be honest, when you are with the kids and family, it's great. You can speak with the... No air defenders. Exactly. And you can bring your kids to the race. And you get that sense of speed when they go through indoors here. Exactly. When you are... You know, these are 200 mile an hour cars now. Yeah. Yeah, not completely. The, the speed is, uh, compared to all the years, is, is crazy how we saw the championship evolve and the car and the tech behind all this work. Also, us, we have uh, two tall drivers. So we have also to compensate at some point because they are, of course, they are more weight than the others. Yeah. So, for example, you, maybe you would think we, we are crazy, but you can see the design of our car. We, we leave like a lot of place in, uh, in carbon because all the car is made in uh, carbon fiber. Yeah. If you, it's yes. very light material. Yeah. And just to uh, win some weight at some point, we leave a lot of part of our car still in carbon without any uh, oh, wrapping. Oh, you leave it bare. Exactly, to, to win some, uh, some weight. Right. So everything is strategy, even the design of the car. The bodywork of the car, that's fixed um, across exactly. all of the... So yeah. that's something that Maserati can't touch. No, exactly. We cannot yeah. touch anything. Last year, the only thing we can uh, change was the, the flap inclination, I would like to say, the flap up, uh, uphill or downhill. Yeah. So it was the flap at the front of the car. Yeah. So last year, for example, that we can choose if you want 10% uh, more, 10% yeah. less. Yeah. But this year we cannot change so much on the on that part and we already test and it will not change uh, yeah. so much in terms of efficiency. Yeah. Take us for a walk if you want to. So Feel I will free. show you like some secret door in the garage because you can see this is the basic garage yeah. and we have some, uh, some doors, so please come with me. This is the bit that I really like, almost as much as the racing. So here, for example, we have all the engineers working. So this is the earth of the company because, of course, you have driver, who is crucial, but also all the team uh, at the back. Each session, for example, you have all the engineers working uh, with the both driver. So you have Max side and you have Eduardo side. So it's like 
two teams in one team, but of course we share everything together. Yeah. It's just to make sure, like Max and Eduardo have his, their own engineers and own mechanics, it's just to make sure we not make any confusion because they have two different styles of driving. Yeah. So just to make sure the setup for Max will go to the Max car. Ah. It's why we split the team in two, uh, two sides, but still we are working uh, all together. And if you film just the screen, there that you can see. someone eating an ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> this is our HQ, so this is mo in Monaco. So this is the simulator oh, okay. room. Exactly. So we have... It's a webcam to Monaco. <laughs> yes. This is the charger of the car. So you have one charger for both cars. So both cars have the same uh, cable. Yeah. We just plug it into the car. Yeah. And in 40 minutes, it's completely charged. 4-0. Four 4-0, zero. Four zero, right. exactly. Okay. okay. So the kilowatt is 80. Yeah. 80 kilowatt, the power into yeah. the, the car. So we spoke also about the tire. Yeah. So as you can see, the tire, so we are limited in, set of, in, a, in number of set of tires, so we don't have any different tires. It will, it will be no soft, no medium tire. No, it's, it's a fixed tire. Exactly, it's and, fixed tire. And you're restricted on amount of tires. Exactly, right? for suitability reason, once again. Yeah. Like for, as is the belader, you will have, will have more set of tire for the weekend, but usually it's only four set of tire. Okay. Only four. four. So, for that one, as is the belader, yeah. so we'll have two more set of tires for the, the weekend, but that's it. And that is it. So you have to do it with, uh, with what you got. Yeah. Mm. Well, this is the charger room, sure. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the charger is just there. So you can see all is, uh, is covered. So this is the spare motors. So I think you can... Uh, oh, it's just like a... So this is like a whole subframe. Like, this is a complete motor. And we're not allowed to show this? No, because it's a part of the motor. Can I just have a look under the... Yeah, sure. Just have a quick look. <laughs> now you know all the secrets. Yeah, yeah. Looks, looks cool. Now you know everything, so... <laughs> I know it all now. But it's cool, so, the, so obviously that is Maserati designed... Exactly, engine, right. yeah. Right. Basically, that's where you buy all your spare parts from if you need other spares. Exactly, this is the, there is a there. spare garage. So yeah. as each team has the same chassis, this is very simple. So the nose, if you need to buy a nose of the car, you just go to the Spark go there. and you put just uh, the, your stickers and the wrapping uh, on. Yeah. So it's the same for each team. But we have always some spare uh, there because during the race, if you, you, can, you can stop if you, uh, have a, like, uh, if you damage, for example, the nose, the front of your car, you can stop in, into the race. We can change the nose quickly and you go back again. Of course, it will be difficult to to be on the points because nobody will stop. You will be the only one who will yeah. do speed stop. Yeah. But sometimes we prefer to, even if we know we'll be maybe last, to continue to run because we collect some data right. for the next races. Right. So we prefer to continue the race even we, if we are if you are last on the grid, but just to collect data for the next one. Right, I see. Why does it start at three minutes past five today? Yeah. Why? <laughs> this is a very good question. Not, not five. No, exactly not five. It's five point four, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's very strange. All the time. Yeah. Very, very odd. Probably. Thanks ever so much, Laurie. No, That's thank wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Funny. This is the fan village. So this is where you go and occupy yourself when you're not looking at the racing. These guys here are all driving the track, the London e -Prix track. And we know that the know-how and the practice of that translates into the real world, into the sea. And obviously it saves you on tires and trailers buying a race car, stuff like that. But I've sneaked up to the starting point. The start lights are just there next to the camera. If you swing that way, we're right at the starting point. Those are the lights and the, look. The actual starting control box. I don't know if I'm supposed to be up here. I've just walked in with purpose, but I'm not going to touch anything. Max, right. Eduardo. Really good to see you guys again. Obviously, race is in less than two hours. Um, tell me how, how it's been. I saw when you were practicing, it was wet outside. That's always a bit weird, going from wet to dry. Uh, on the track, the track has multiple conditions. What are the biggest challenges for you today? And what bits have gone well and what bits haven't gone so well? Well, as you mentioned, the weather can play a role quite a bit on this track and uh, practice was wet outside so we got some experience there. Qualifying was fully dry and uh, I think we're not entirely happy about qualifying because we didn't qualify in the top 10 with, with both cars so we have a bit of work to do for the race. We um, need to catch up a bit to, to score some points but uh, yeah still uh, I think we can do 
good things from there and uh, have a good race. Yep. How about you? Yeah, uh, we had an intense day starting with uh, the free practice session that was on mixed conditions. It had just rained uh, in the morning, so obviously here it's a little bit special because you've got an indoor part that is always staying dry and the outdoor part that, is, uh, that was wet. Yeah. And then quali was on full, uh, full dry conditions. Um, as Max mentioned, uh, it, didn't, it didn't go bad, it didn't go well. We are, we are sort of like in the middle of the pack. Uh, I think starting from 11th and uh, 14. 14. Yeah. And uh, so from there, we will try to, to get in, into the top 10, score some points. Um, and yeah, let's see what we can do. What's it like having uh, no tyre choice? You, you just have to live with the tyre that you've got. What's that like in the wet? Is it a bit difficult? Well, I mean, the tyres, you, you, you have to treat them well. So you need to get some temperature into the tyres inside in order to, to get some decent grip outside. For sure, you know, these tyres, they're all better tyres. So yeah. you drive them both in the dry and in the wet, meaning that the grip is not very high in both the condition, yeah. especially when it's wet. So, no, it's a, it's a good challenge. I think the race should be dry, from what we know. Yeah. But tomorrow could be more exciting with the, with the rain outside. What are you adjusting and playing with while you're trying to set the fastest lap? Because it's, and it's a narrow circuit, right? So, you know, there, are, there, were, there was an incident in practice, I think, with a bit of a collision. Yeah. You're trying not to crash, obviously. You're trying to come top three. But what else are you changing about the car as you go? There are a lot of like settings that you can uh, that you can adjust, like in the car. And each each of the teams we have uh, our own secrets, let's say, you know, to adjust, uh, uh, you know, the you know particular variables. And uh, um, I would say that most of the work is done uh, prior to the sessions, in, in the sense that you know it's very difficult now um, to have the right decisions when you're driving yeah. to adjust, you know. The cars are so complex now that in order to have like the right decisions in terms of settings, it's quite difficult for us. Yeah. We obviously have um, a direct impact with the, with the way we drive and with the, there are little things that you can do. Yeah. But I would say that most of the things are done by the engineers. Right. So, the, so the level of region, um, many, many things. The, the ratio like between um, how much you regen, like with your front powertrain or, or your rear powertrain, all these things are done, like I would say, by the engineers. The, watching the footage of you guys, POV, is amazing because that's when you get the real idea of how fast you're going. I mean, standing on the start, finish straight, it, it did feel really, really quick. Um, do you actually like the circuit? Is this one of the more difficult circuits or is it, is it one of your favorites or is it a bit of a like, just grit your teeth and get it done. Because this is the finale, right? This is the last one. So uh, Certainly it's very unique, you know, with the indoor part. Um, the track is very technical. You have so many corners. It's quite slow, actually, but uh, to do like the perfect lap, it's, it's demanding. So definitely... You're looking to clip curbs, track. get close to the, a lot of the walls. Yes, you have to use uh, all the space available. You do, yeah. Well, I really hope that it goes well for you and you can unlock some magic. But thanks very much for your Thank time. You. Thank you. I know you've so got to get on and do Thank what you. you do. Well, we've managed to get on the grid uh, 20 minutes before the race starts. Some really happy people with drums. This is Max's Maserati. Always feels good to be on the grid, you know, because it all kicks off in 15 minutes uh, when the track very much goes live. But there's a good atmosphere. A lot of people, I've noticed a lot of families, a lot of young people. They're probably drawn towards the fact that this is a very software, you know, computer-based competition, really. And this whole rise in sim driving and gaming simulators probably lends itself really well to Formula E, given that some of the edges on the competition are done via software uh, management of batteries, you know, computer-based skills. A bit like when ECUs were starting to become tuned with laptops, that whole side of, of, of tuning cars suddenly meant that you didn't have to have oily fingers as such. Okay, so Giovanni, we've, uh, I've managed to come backstage as it were. It's a very busy working garage here in the pits. First of all though, I want to talk to you about general Maserati racing before we go into specific Formula E, because you oversee Maserati racing beyond Formula E, don't yep. you? Maserati Corse, uh, 
captures three different um, aspects of racing. Uh, obviously, Formula E, which we announced last year, but then we also announced that we're going back to GT racing. Yeah. We develop a GT2 car, and we actually unveiled it at Spa this past um, end of June. Yeah. And then also the Project 24, which is a limited edition, 60 units only. It's a track-only car, uh, almost a million dollar price point with 740 horsepower engine, the Tuno engine. Uh, so Maserati Corsa captures and kind of closes in into it those three aspects of racing. Yeah. So with your sort of, you got one foot in the piston camp, one foot in the high voltage camp. <laughs> yes, exactly. Do, is there much crossover like with, with sort of race knowledge? I mean, obviously the, the powertrain here, and, and I, I want to know a bit more about your tactics, team tactics. What do you do in a situation like this? Half, we're indoors now. We're in a building. Yeah, exactly. It's very strange. That's the thing. You really get if you come to races. I mean, if you watch if you watch a uh, motorsport race on on television, you get one sense of the racing. But then yeah. when you come in the garage in the pit lane, you talk to the drivers, you talk to the team principal, you get a sense how complicated and complex the sport really is. You mentioned indoor, outdoor. You mentioned weather. If it's rain, if it's dry, that changes the dynamics of the race. It changes the strategy of the race and how a driver and our team or engineers kind of create that path to get into the podium. Yeah. Extremely complex. Formula E adds another variable to it, which is the energy consumption. Obviously, you have to maintain that um, you're, when you're racing the track, whether it's a straightaway or turns, it's going to allow you to really create a strategy. How am I going to consume that energy? Do I yeah. want to be at the first or do I want to be third or fourth as a strategic approach? And the consumption of the energy from the battery, obviously, is key. And if you watch the end of a Formula E race, you'll see not only where they, they are in the, on the classification first or last, but you'll see that 0.01 energy left. Really? And exactly. And, and when you see that, you get a sense that not only do you have to be a great driver performance-wise, you're competing against 21 other drivers. Everyone yeah. wants to get to the podium. Plus, you have to maintain your energy consumption in such a way that you're not just rolling over the finish line. Yeah. You want to win and you want to get to the of podium. Course. So this is where I think when you come and you, and you get a sense of Formula E, you really get a, you appreciate all that goes into it. Now, this is the first single seat Maserati race car in what you were saying like six decades. Yeah, over 60 years. It's a long, long time. So the trickle down tech from this to road cars is probably quite quick. It's quicker than we might have seen in F1 and stuff like that. Absolutely. The next 10 years, I think, are going to be extremely exciting because the first 10 years have been exciting. You can imagine with all the learnings we've had in the first uh, part of this championship, how much we can bring to the table moving forward. Thanks for your time. I wish you, you all the best for Thank the race. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. <laughs>I did not predict how unpredictable this race was going to be. There was so much contact between the cars. The safety car was so damn busy, it was ridiculous. The race was red flagged several times and Eduardo nearly had his chances completely destroyed when another competitor missed their braking point and collided straight into the back of him. But the guys battled and they came home eighth and 10th amongst the madness. A day later, the last race of the season had been finished and that was under even more dangerous and unpredictable conditions. Maserati finished their first single seat racing since they bowed out in 1957 and they seem to have progressed quickly from scoring three points in the first six races to 137 in the second half of the season. As the sun sets over London, I feel like there is a new dawning for Maserati, a new dawning involving electric cars and piston cars. And for a long time, I feel like the mojo is back and maybe waiting all this time before they went back into single seat rating was actually worth it. Maybe they're gonna turn 110 and be in the best shape that they've been in for decades and decades and decades. I've seen their products and it looks like they're actually building cars with real passion and conviction again. And I've also seen in the last few years how Formula E has evolved and evolved and is attracting a new type of person. And that is only a good thing for someone who's a car enthusiast and wants to enjoy the rich history of cars like Maserati, but also see where the future is going. I'm actually really excited. I hope you are too. Let me know in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching this episode of The Late Break Show. If you haven't already subscribed, go and subscribe.